There we go. So welcome, everyone. I'm really excited to have everyone here. I'm excited to see that uh, we have some repeat customers who've come. Actually, some people have come to our last two First Amendment webinars. So I'm glad we have groupies now, I guess we could say. And I'm really excited to have our two great speakers here tonight. And just to give you a sense of why uh, freedom of the press, attacks on journalists, attacks on journalism is such an important topic. Um, in the last few years, there's been an increasing number of assaults against journalists, arrests of journalists who are simply covering the news, doing their job. Uh, they've had equipment confiscated or damaged, um, and they've been denied access to elected officials and documents that they should have uh, access to. And the reason is because journalism is so important. It's so important to have um, that uh, those eyes and ears uh, monitoring what's going on with our democracy. Obviously, it's important enough that it's enshrined in the First Amendment to the Constitution. So I just wanted to give you some uh, figures and then we will go right to our panelists. Um, according to the US Press Freedom Tracker, which is a great source of data on ills that are visited upon journalists, um, as far as assault goes, in 2018, there were 41 assaults on journalists, and in 2019, 42 assaults on journalists. In 2020, particularly after George Floyd was murdered and in the protests that followed, there were 629 assaults. Thank you, Lucy, for putting that link there, uh, which is really incredible. And then last year was 145, so it came down a little, but it's still almost four times what it was just a couple of years ago. Um, and as far as arrests go, we went from nine in 2019 to 144 in 2020. And you know, the, when the president of the United States says that um, reporters are the enemy of the people, that doesn't help the cause either. So let me introduce you to our two speakers uh, this evening. Uh, Lucy Westcott, she became the director of the Committee to, to, to Protect Journalists Emergencies Department in October 2021. She first joined CPJ in 2018 as the James W. Foley Fellow. And during that fellowship, she focused on safety issues for women journalists in non-hostile environments and assisted with the creation of safety resources for journalists globally. In 2021, she played a prominent role in CPJ's response to the Afghan crisis, including helping Afghan journalists and their families who were evacuated. Prior to joining CPJ, Westcott was a staff writer for Newsweek, and she's reported for The Intercept, Bustle, The Atlantic, and Women Under Siege, and she was a United Nations correspondent for the Interpress Service. She has a master's degree in multi-platform journalism from the University of Maryland College Park. Welcome, Lucy. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you, right. so much. Thanks. Our other panelist is John Jordan, whose career in news, like mine, is his second career. I love that. And it's an outgrowth of his creative passions. He's a native of Corpus Christi who grew up in Venezuela, Trinidad, Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. His father worked in the oil industry. John studied music composition at North Texas State University, which is now UNT. A bassist, he spent three decades touring and recording for about half that time with the blues guitarist Chris, Chris Duarte. In 2005, he stopped touring to work on Kinky Friedman's gubernatorial campaign. He has visited all of Texas's 254 counties and every state except Alaska. Later on in his career, he joined the Austin Bureau of the Dallas Morning News, where he worked for four years before joining the Texas Tribune in 2012, where he is now the deputy photo editor. So welcome, John. And if everyone could please mute yourselves, that would be great, or I can mute you. So, um, all right, so let me start by just bringing you guys a little bit in closer focus to us. There we go. And I wanna start by asking both of you, um, why is the First Amendment important to democracy? In, in what way? And that includes, you know, particularly in America, but also overseas. So Lucy, since you've got that kind of global focus, if you could comment on that first, please. Absolutely, Ruth. Um, and again, thank you so much. And thank you to Engage Texas for having us here today. Um, 
Freedom of the press is, of course, absolutely crucial and essential to democracy. Um, it's really quite simple. Uh, as somebody who is about to take their oath of US citizenship next week, um, and as someone who's been working towards that for many years, uh, this is something that's very, very deeply personal as well. Um, a democracy cannot function without a free press. And we at CPJ at the Committee to Protect Journalists recognize that when you see a backsliding of the free press um, in a country, that tends to be a sign or a symptom that the democracy there or the, the situation in that country is not in a good way. Um, because you alluded to it, Ruth, in your introduction, when, you, when we had um, President Trump referring to journalists as fake news or enemies of the people, what that does and what that did uh, was to embolden world leaders of other countries um, that have not so pleasant human rights records, it emboldened them to say the same things, therefore putting journalists in those countries at, at risk as well. Thank you very much and congratulations, by the way, on your impending citizenship, your impending oath. So John, same question, why is freedom of the press so important to democracy? There, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it's so interesting to me because it's, uh, it's not, it, it's not a special power. It's, it's a, it's a special guarantee. It's journalists are simply citizens with certain kind of training and a certain uh, genetic disposition for nosiness perhaps, but we are not in any way different than anybody else in the United States. And so um, uh, if, if journalism is a superpower or a secret power, it's actually a power that, that is, belongs to all citizens, you know? And, uh, and that freedom of the press is also the freedom of assembly and the freedom of speech and, and all of those things go completely hand in hand. So, you know, uh, uh, when you dial in sort of to the specific freedom of the press aspect of the First Amendment, what you're doing is you're bringing in an outside arbiter to the constructs of government. You're bringing in uh, an outside um, and critical eye to the, the functions of government, you know, and, uh, and we, we are the fourth leg of the stool and we are an unofficial leg. We are the outsiders in all of this. And I think that that outsider function is just is so crucial to how it works, and um, and and one of the one of the really important things uh, about our constitution, you know, <laughs> if not the most important thing about it. Thanks, John. So, Lucy, since you have um, you know the sort of global view with your work with CPJ you know, what happens in some of these countries um, where uh, the press is not free or is under assault? Um, tell us what happens. Yes, um, so I, having a global focus, obviously that's enormous. So what I decided to do was take a look at some of the stories that we have reported on and some of the alerts and statements that we have issued over the past week at CPJ, just to give everyone here an idea of just how widespread um, press freedom violations are all over the world. So we've had the very, uh, very unfortunate deaths of two young journalists in Haiti who were shot dead earlier this week while reporting. Uh, we had a journalist in the DRC in the Democratic Republic of the Congo arrested and detained while filming in public something you are, of course, absolutely right and able to do as a journalist. In Germany, uh, we had and documented attacks on two reporters who were reporting on a discussion about energy prices. Um, in Peru, a bomb was detonated outside of a TV station. And in Chad, uh, another photojournalist was beaten and arrested while covering a protest. And you'll see that that's two references there to journalists who work in visual mediums, and I'm sure John um, we can have a little bit more of a discussion about that later. Um, we see everything in countries all over the world from jailings of journalists, the killings of journalists, um, the denial of access and the discrediting of journalism and journalists as a profession and a, of an industry as well. Part of CPJ's role is to, we, we have three roles. We advocate for journalists, we report and document on press freedom violations and other cases. And we assist journalists directly, and that's that's my job. Um, but when we every year uh, we take stock of the number of journalists who are in prison worldwide, 
as well as the number of journalists who have been killed. Um, and so while we are working on this year's census now, what I can tell you is last year in 2021, we had a record number of journalists in prison. Um, that number is 293. Um, and the majority of those journalists were in Asia. Um, and the top countries for, top three countries for the jailing of journalists um, will likely come as no surprise, but they are China, Myanmar and Egypt as well. Mm. Um, if I can add, because it plays an increasing role in my work, in many, many cases when the threats against journalists and the situation is so bad and one's life and the lives of their families are at risk, journalists go into exile. Um, this is something we have seen the entire time that CPJ has been in existence. But I can tell you since becoming director of this department, we've had the crisis in Afghanistan, we've had the ongoing crisis in Myanmar, we've had a mass exodus of journalists from Russia. That is often the last option, but it is used, and that in itself is a silencing um, of journalism. Wow. And, and John, since Lucy brought it up, what special risks or situations do photojournalists face? And do you have like some concrete examples of? I would, I would invite you, I just, I dropped a link in a few minutes ago at 638. Um, uh, if you, I'd invite you to click on that and, and just have a look at um, our photojournalists and how they sometimes go out into the world. Interesting. Um, it's, yeah. uh, uh, it's so it, it, it's so variable too because there's sometimes where you need to identify yourself as press and there's sometimes where it's really important that you not identify yourself as press and you have to be uh, so aware and and intuitive in a chaotic situation to know what moment you're in and that moment can literally change in a split second and um, you know and <laughs> the challenges of 2020 were extraordinary, but not, uh, uh, but not unprecedented. It was just there. There was, you know, on top of, uh, on on top of the the civil unrest that we covered, and there it, there were a lot of protests and rallies in Texas, um, and a lot of rage in Texas. George Floyd is, in fact, was born in Houston. Um, there, uh, uh, there was also the added risk of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, gearing up, which is always sort of a daunting, <laughs> it's an intense amount of, it's, it's, it's always daunting. And then it became sort of even more daunting and even more of a challenge uh, to prepare these people, you know, in this incredibly sort of visual, I mean, visible sort of role that they play in journalism, because you are out there, you know, most every photographer has two cameras on him and a variety of lenses and there's no way to disguise that there's you can't just put your notebook in your back pocket and step back you're you, you're instantly identified so one place that you oversaw photojournalists that you know was sort of a flashpoint in some ways for journalists was Uvalde after the school shooting there. Can you tell us a little bit, when we talked, you told me about some of the strategies that you came up with for the journalists to stay safe there. So tell us what it was like there and what strategies you used, please. Well, the, you know, the, in, uh, in, in some ways this gets to a, a broader point that I hope to sort of, that I hope to make today, but, uh, you know, Uvalde is a small town of 16,000 people and this unspeakable tragedy befell um, them and befell the most vulnerable people in Uvalde. And uh, Uvalde is a, a, a very much a working class town. Uh, you know, the only rich people in Uvalde are either, you know, multi-generational families of power or people from elsewhere. Um, uh, but the, but the, the citizens of Uvalde itself are very much hardworking, not far from the border, you know, close-knit community who saw this an unbelievable event, this unbelievable tragedy descend on them. And then in the in immediate aftermath of this uh, horrible event, um, the press descended on this town from uh, all over the world and all over the country and, of course, all over Texas. 
and uh, and there was uh, in the initial shock, I think that there was sort of uh, there was one level of expectation and one level of acceptance. But I think as time went by, this this became two just ordinary Uvalians came to feel more and more uh, like an invasion, which in, it, it was an invasion. Let's be really honest about it. And um, uh, and the citizens reacted in one particular way. The government, the city government of Uvalde reacted in another um, a police, the police department reacted in yet another way and other um, uh, uh, police forces from other communities came in to help out and to sort of join into this, uh, this sort of reaction to the press that was there. And then some biker gangs showed up to also sort of react to this. So you had this, you had this really, uh, this really extremely volatile situation in Uvalde. And um, to be completely fair and to be completely transparent about it, um, it's understandable. It's not, it's not incomprehensible that, uh, that there was this reaction to it, you know, and, and, and you, there are different, different levels of, of journalism and there are different approaches to journalism and there are different, uh, there are different sensibilities that different organizations have as I go into a situation like this. Um, and kind of the most obvious, and I think that most of us have encountered this, even from just watching, you know, uh, TV shows, we've seen, you know, uh, it's, it's almost a cliche really that, that you know, that a television crew will stand on your mother's head to get a shot. There's, there's nothing that they won't do to, to get what they want. And, and they're, they're frankly quite ruthless about it, you know, and, um, and they, they're a little bit arrogant about it. And so you have this, there, there's these different dynamics that are going on with the sort of individual personalities of particular news organizations going on. So it's a complex situation. And, uh, and for biker groups and for outside police officers, and for local police officers, the local constabulary, and for the local city government to restrict access. I mean, all of these, um, I think that all of these are con contextual and, and can be understood, but at the same time, there are clear, uh, there are clear rights that we have that aren't, the, as I said before, aren't the rights of journalists. They're the rights of Americans. And they're the rights of people in this country. They don't even have to be American. The rights of these people, and if, I can I can take whatever kind of picture or whatever kind of film, or whatever kind of you know whatever I want to do, whatever kind of notes I want to make. If I'm standing on a public street, I have every right as an American to do that. Mm -hmm. so, um, uh, so so this is a long roundabout answer to say that we as a Texas Tribune went in and with the understanding that we uh, were were in a complex situation for the press, a complex situation particularly and especially for the people of Uvalde, and that we wanted to approach this um, as uh, treating it like it's the long game. We are, we have been there throughout this yeah. entire ordeal there, and we aren't going away anytime soon. Yeah. We'll be there long. You know, we've, we've been there after the first wave of cameras shut down. Mm -hmm. We stayed there and, and uh, there were sort of, there's been a couple of returns as more news has come up. And we've been there steadfast throughout and we've been building relationships Mm -hmm. with the people we've been building relationships with a lot of the police um some of my photographers were building relationships with those bikers mm -hmm. and with those out-of-town cops because it's not a black and white situation so yeah. i know that was a really long answer <laughs> that's okay so lucy did you have something in particular you wanted to say or yeah i just um john that's that's that was a that was a great that's really interesting thank you so much um what you're saying Kind of chimed with a lot of I put a link to CPJ's uh we did a couple of interviews with journalists who reported from Uvalde about um some police obstruction and the biker gangs came up as well and as you were speaking John it just something that has struck me about reporting and and journalism in the U.S. over the past few years is increasingly I think there's just a media literacy issue going on and I think this this certainly COVID made this so much worse but just a basic understanding of what journalism is and what the job of a journalist is. And that has become so um, cluttered and unclear um, among many groups of people, especially when you are reporting on these awful tragedies um, like the one in Uvalde. So you, I just wanted to make that point that I think it's, 
it's always a good idea to remind people what exactly the role of, of journalism is. And I personally see it as a safety issue as well. Mm -hmm. So what would you say, you know, to help people understand exactly what journalism is, people who have struggled with media literacy? Yeah, I think it's a basic civics. Um, it's a civics thing, right? I mean, I think that people getting their news from quite polarized places as well doesn't help. Um, yeah, so I think I think it's it's perhaps something that needs to happen in schools, but I think for some people they might just be too, a little bit too far gone. <laughs> and so, you know, we were talking about journalist safety, and I, obviously that's your field at CPJ. So tell me, I'm particularly interested in places since we kind of, you know, we're talking about the First Amendment, places where there aren't protections at all for the kinds of things journalists are able to do here. And when we were talking, you mentioned um, Afghanistan and Ukraine as two flashpoints in the world. So if you can just tell us the safety issues for those journalists. Yeah. Um, Afghanistan is is a, I mean, I, it's a dreadful, awful situation there for journalists. Um, I was privileged enough to be able to work firsthand with journalists that we helped to evacuate to Doha. Um, and then onwards to their new countries. And many of those journalists had direct threats from the Taliban far before August the 15th of last year that were directly retired, they were directly tied to their reporting. So I sat with journalists who told me that if they had not been able to get on that plane in the chaos of the airport in Kabul, they would be dead, um, which is obviously a very, very heavy thing to hear. And I'm extremely glad we were able to get them to safety. Um, right now for journalists in Afghanistan, we hear from do dozens of them daily that they do not feel safe and they want to leave. Um, who can solve that problem? The Taliban, of course, but also Western governments who simply have not provided enough pathways for Afghan journalists to leave the country. Um, many are in Pakistan. Many do not feel safe in Pakistan. Um, is is a pretty hopeless situation. Like I don't want to be too negative, but but in Afghanistan in particular, it's it's not good, um, especially of course for women, and especially for those who belong to minority groups as well. Um, we are able to give some kind of you know basic digital safety advice to journalists in Afghanistan who are very worried that at any point. Um, the Taliban can look at their phone and see that they have, you know, see all their contacts, see that they have been in touch with Western organizations or Western newsrooms. Um, but that is just an ongoing protracted crisis that at this point is really a humanitarian crisis. Um, but for everyone who is on this call, um, you must, we, we, we encourage you of course to support Afghan journalism um, and, and read the journalism that is still able to come out of the country, of course. Um, in Ukraine, we have a very different situation. Uh, there we have an active, more traditional on the ground conflict. Um, we are not seeing as many journalists leave the country. They are co very committed to staying and covering this war. Um, men of military age, of course, can't leave. Um, and they are the journalists that we're in touch with about their relocation, they're moving within the country. So usually from the east um, to the west. There, the issue is PPE. Um, at the beginning of this conflict, there was a global shortage of pro uh, personal protective equipment. Why? Because a lot of that was going to the military, but also um, companies that traditionally made helmets, jackets, bulletproof vests, that kind of thing, pivoted during COVID. So there was just a global lack of it. That's something that we really struggled with. Um, and of course, the journalists struggled with it as well. At the moment, um, you know, as, as the situation there unfolds, journalists in Ukraine, and that's Ukrainian journalists, but also foreign journalists who are going in, they need to worry about things like UXO, unexploded ordnance, mines. Um, we have, I will share the link in a minute, but we have safety advice on how to deal with those situations as well. Um, the way we think about safety at CPJ, it falls into three buckets, physical safety, digital safety, and then psychosocial safety or your mental health. Wherever a journalist is, those three things are always overlapping. So for that reason, we also, you know, always encourage digital safety best practices, social media hygiene for journalists everywhere as well. Thank you. So, 
Yeah, John, as far as, you know, the the reporters that you work with and yourself, mental health issues as far as, you know, the the stress of the job and potentially being exposed to traumatic situations, how is that going and, you know, what kind of measures, if any, do you have in place to help journalists feel safe and healthy? There, you know, there, there, yeah, there's a lot of aspects to it. I think, you know, it's so important at the outset to, to just have a really uh, frank conversation uh, about the pitfalls and, and acquaint them with, if they're not a, as a, an experienced a journalist, with, uh, uh, with some of the things that they might encounter as they do it. Because, you know, some younger journalists who are just coming up um, uh, si simply don't know how, uh, how incredibly impactful and stressful it can be. Um, and they're eager to get out there and they're eager to get out there and make their mark. And, um, and it's really important to forewarn and forearm them. You know, I think, I, I think one of the things that's uh, really important that we do at the Texas Tribune is we, uh, we discuss very, very seriously um, uh, awareness of your surroundings, having an exit strategy, um, and crucially, it's so crucial to get it over that you, we not only um, are making you aware of these, uh, you know, of the need for awareness and for having an exit strategy and for all of those sort of physical safety things, but to also know that it's okay to avail yourself of them, because it's one thing, it's one thing to, it's one thing to offer those tools, those incredibly useful and important tools to journalists. It's quite another for them to actually feel comfortable and for them to hear the message and believe the message that your safety is more important to us than this story. Your safety is more important to us than this awesome photograph that you might get if you put yourself in harm's way. We, and, and, and you know, you just have to repeat it over and over and you have to, and you have to prove it. You have to prove it. You, and sometimes you have to reach in and pull them out. Yeah. So you know what? I just want you to step back from this. Uh, and I've been doing this for years, and years, you know, quite a few years now, and um, in my second career, you know. And and one of the things that I've really learned is just, you know, that you're staying in constant contact with these people. And then, you know, on the backside of it, whether it's the backside at the end of a day, or the back end of a long assignment, or it's the back end of a protracted, you know, for example, the summer of 2020, or for the protracted. Um, time that we've spent in Uvalde, you know, that we uh, that we debrief these people and that we have real conversations with people and that we make sure that they know what resources are available to them uh, that are available through the Texas Tribune, through their own personal insurance that they have at the Texas Tribune, you know, to just, it's, it's one thing to just, you know, if, if they're anything like me, they have only the dimmest idea of what they're insured for. So, <laughs> you know, so part of you know, so part of our so part of our responsibility as managers of these people is to actually make sure that they understand that these resources are available, and we want you to take advantage of them. And it's just a steady, constant, sincere, authentic message from the organization that they're working for, whether they're freelancers, whether they're full-time staff whether they're a part of our magnificent fellowship program, you know, all of those people are equal and are treated equally in that sense by us. And, you know, I, we, all, we all experience and go through these things in different ways. And the final message that we try to really impart to all, and this includes journalists, and this includes photo editors like me, who are just basically looking at you know, unbelievable numbers of photographs, and that has an impact on your psyche too, right? Um, you know, it's uh, the thing. The thing that's so important is um, everybody has a different tolerance, and we tolerate your different tolerances. We celebrate the difference in tolerance that you have, and uh, and uh, and some people can go forever, and and apparently with no damage, and other people cannot, and that's fine that's fine and um and sometimes you can like be incredibly tough and resolute and go through all sorts of stuff and then something happens and that's just not something that you can deal with that's okay too you know you don't have to be tough forever you may be tough for a little while that's fine you may suddenly lose that toughness 
that's fine. And it's just, uh, I'll, I'll just say it again. It's just so important to just constantly, gently, and uh, lovingly. I don't know if news organizations are supposed to use that word, but lovingly reinforce that message constantly with the people that we work with, you know. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Lucy, you know, talking about mental health, how big of an issue is that globally? Yeah, um, it's a huge issue. And the, the one thing that we've, I mean, obviously, again, going back to COVID, it exacerbated so many things, right? For journalists, you were essential workers, in many cases, you were out there covering a story in your own home. Um, I remember speaking to a war correspondent in the earlier days of COVID, and we were talking about this very topic, and he's based here in the US, and he'd gone to Iraq and other places, but was able to come home, and that was a separation, right? That was over there, now he is safe here. What COVID meant was that you weren't safe in your safe place, right? Um, and for many, for many, um, journalists going out to hospitals or other places meant that they were put at significant risk and that then risked their families as well. So that was a, that was a mental um, toll. What we do know from journalists in the US, um, because there has been a really good pilot project called the Journalist Trauma Support Network. Um, people here might be familiar with the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma. It's based here in New York. Um, and this was, a, this was a pilot project to train therapists in kind of journalism specific areas so that that would be everything from I'm having trouble with this story and my boss is being mean my journalism boss my editor all the way to um I I, I, I witnessed a dead body or I was involved in a horror you know it really runs the spectrum um and that was a huge success because the clinicians that were used were trained in what journalists deal with. What we hear from journalists is that number one, mental health care is quite expensive. Even if it is something that your newsroom might pay for, it, it, it's not always good because the people that you're speaking to and your, your clinicians might say, well, why did you go to that protest? If you could have avoided going to it, why did you call that person if you knew that they were going to be awful to you? And then there is the burden of trying to explain, well, this is my job. Um, so there is a global need for more clinicians um, in many more languages. Um, again, this, this goes back as well to journalists who are in exile, who have been ripped from their home countries because of their identity as a journalist, put somewhere new that might be temporary. They might not ever be able to work as a journalist again. That is enormously damaging. So it is a very, very big issue. Mm, wow. John, if you'll, and well, first let me just say if uh, people were, you know, we're going to go to questions shortly. So if you want to put your questions in the chat, feel free. Otherwise, you know, we can unmute and talk. But John, if you'll indulge me, okay, because like I said, my, my journalism career was my second career as well. What was your, how different has it turned out to be, especially in these last few years that have seen a bit of turmoil? How different is it from, you know, being a journalist, being an editor, from what you imagined that it would be? That's a that's a really interesting question because um, I, I think that I, I grew up I grew up in a, 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 a in a family that was just obsessed with reading, and um, and our, our I, I'm, it's just a family for my father, mother, sister, and I. So it was a small family. And we had a, a lifelong tradition of sitting down to a meal and arguing about politics with our very conservative father. And, and this was, and he was a really good arguer and a really smart guy. And, and so he, he really forced us into a certain, a certain rigor about the stuff that we would bring to the table because he was able to really shoot it down if it wasn't rigorous. So, um, so I think that there were some things that I sort of really understood and um, uh, and immediately proceeding, uh, becoming, joining the world of journalists, I've worked on a political campaign, um, which was sort of a Wild West show in a way, but it was an authentic political campaign in another way. I mean, uh, we were an independent campaign that had to organize and acquire an astonishingly large number of uh, registered voters' signatures to even get the candidate on the ballot. 
So, I mean, there was, there was a tremendous ground effort that went on. At the end of that, at the end of that, which was basically for me, that was about 18 months that I was on that campaign. At the end of it, the people that I remembered the, the most and that I liked the best were the reporters who were covering the campaign. And the thing that I noticed and loved about them was that they had neither fear nor favor um, uh, for our candidate or of any other of the candidates. And there was a big field of gubernatorial candidates that year. There were Democrat or Republican and two independents mm -hmm. and a, some other weirdos as well. So it was, mm -hmm. you know, so, uh, so it, was, it was just watching those journalists work and watching them sort of from the the advantage of someone on a, working on a political campaign, I was the field director finally, uh, it, you know, about halfway through the campaign, I became the field director. So these people were essentially my enemy, right? I mean, uh, and th that word enemy was variable depending on, you know, uh, on how close they were getting <laughs> to things that we didn't want them necessarily to know, but th it's an adversarial relationship, you know, but I appreciated the integrity with which they um, approach this adversarial relationship. And so at the end of it, when I had the opportunity to go to the Dallas Morning News after a time, I was like, I knew some of those journalists because they'd covered the campaign. So I knew them. So I was already sort of sort of like halfway in already. I think that what surprised me, what I didn't sort of understand um, is um, exactly what I sort of alluded to early on, which what I, I don't think I understand. I think in a way I thought that there was a license to journal, mm -hmm. you know, that there was like a badge and I'm John Jordan journalist, you know, and, and it was like being in the FBI or something. And mm -hmm. it was just, it was really sort of startling for me to realize that no, these, these are, uh, these people have no special extra rights. And uh, what they have is expertise and training and determination. You know, um, so um, as far as that, how that relates to the last sort of really intense last few years, and honestly, it's kind of always really intense in Texas. Um, and I would say that I would say this gotten more intense lately, but it's always been this is for a long time. It's been like a, a sort of the news nexus in the world. You know, I think that um, I, I think that I was by sort of coming into this world uh, gradually and uh, and working for an organization that wasn't necessarily in its inception a breaking news organization, I sort of was eased into it. So I think that um, uh, I, I think that I've really learned as I've gone along. And so my preconceptions have sort of vanished a little bit. You know, I, I don't remember exactly what they were. Um, and it's just gotten more and more steadily 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 more intense and we've become at the texas tribune more and more a uh, daily breaking news organization in addition to the big projects that we do you know and that's been a gradual progression as well mm -hmm. so in a way i would say that i've sort of waded into it mm -hmm. thanks and lucy if i can ask you a similarly subjective question how do you see journalism in a different like light since having transition from being a working journalist to working for CPJ, is there a difference? Yes. Um, <laughs> I mean, I can say that I miss reporting as much as I used to, mm -hmm. um, but that's okay, right? I can still do it sometimes, but I do miss that. Um, part of the reason why I, I used to report on CPJ, um, not exclusively, of course, but I would report for Newsweek uh, on kind of international news and conflict and as I said at the beginning, the press freedom um, survey that we do at the end of every year, you know, it says something about a country. And so whenever the census would come out, I'd report on it. Um, I think it certainly opened my eyes to just, I mean, I joined in 2018 and I would say things have gotten worse since then. Mm. Um, just how, how easy it is, I think, in many places to silence journalists. Um, to censor them, to make them feel afraid and intimidated. I joined CPJ to focus on uh, female journalists in non-hostile environments, um, meaning the US, because that's what I was and am, and drew on my own experiences of being harassed and threatened um, and just wanted to make sure that didn't happen to other people. So I I, th I think what CPJ has been able to, in my in my role, it, it's brought me closer to many journalists at risk. Being able to speak to them and help them is truly an honor. 
Um, and I can just say that my, my eyes have been much, my eyes have been opened um, okay. with that transition. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, let's transition into some questions. And I'm actually kind of curious for our audience today, who I think there's no journalists among them, but I could be wrong. But I'm just curious, you know, if there's been you know, a, a, a shift over the last few years or even over the course of this webinar um, in how you look at the First Amendment and journalism and all of that. But we do have one question in the chat um, from Pawasha. It's what country receives or is most welcoming to journalist asylees? Is the U.S. friendly? Lucy, you could probably address that. Yes, um, we don't have hard data on that, but I, you know, we we have worked with many journalists who have come here um, and applied for for refugee protection. Um, I would say Canada is also a, a, a friendly country. Um, in over the past year, with with Afghans, um, Germany has been quite open. Ireland also. Um, Let's see other Europe. There are a few other European countries as well, but but the U.S. has been quite good um, with Ukrainians. That's a different situation again because that's not all journalists. But there's been a different coming together of you know Europe wide kind of opening of arms to Ukrainians for sure. Um, but no, the U.S. We 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 know of many journalists who have come here for safety. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned when you were talking about Afghanistan that Western leaders could do more to help journalists there get out I mean is that happening at all or um we always at CPJ advocate for safe pathways for journalists um, and emergency visas as well mm -hmm. and CPJ and our partner organizations you know we we can't do this work alone we work with many partner organizations like Reporters Without Borders um, or the International Women's Media Foundation we have all um found it extremely challenging that there is basically no path and in, in very very uh, rare circumstances now is a journalist in our experience able to get to a western country because of the lack of visas and, and the lack of ability to do that thanks i have a feeling that alex has a question because you turned your camera on and i know you always have a question so <laughs> I'm, I'm always curious. Maybe I should have been a journalist. Well, you wrote a book. I mean, you're an author, right? <laughs> yeah. So I actually have two. I'm curious. I heard Lucy say that some people sometimes are too far gone on in terms of their literacy or their bias or something. And I'm curious if you have something that you either ask people or share with them so that they at least consider that there may be another view or something of that nature. So I'm just sort of, you know, because I, I guess I'm, I'm too hopeful that I don't want to just, you know, assume that they're, that, that everyone is going to have blinders on all the time. Uh, so that's my first question. My second question is, um, I'm curious what both of you think of uh, Julian Assange and specifically, do you consider him a journalist? And um, and so, um, if so, why? And if not, why not? Thank you. Who wants to go first? <laughs> sure, I can. I can take that first question, Alex. Thank you very much. So, if I could just clarify um, by the too far gone comment, I think what I meant by that is um, perhaps some people's inability to see journalists as as a neutral party, right? Um, and just the the endless kind of seeing journalists as an enemy, right? And that is very, very unhelpful. Um, we at CPJ do not have like a document or something that we can show people, but what we can show people is what happens in countries where journalists are routinely harassed, um, denigrated, arrested, and then what happens to the free press after that. Um, if I can just use a recent example, Russia, um, there is, of course, this fake news law that they fake news law that they um, put into place in March. Any reporting on, you know, calling the war in Ukraine a war, or reporting on the military in a way that was not accepted, that could land you up to 15 years in prison. Mm -hmm. um, we have heard from Russian journalists who just say there is no independent media left. 
So that's an example of a country where the situation for journalists has been extremely bad for a very long time. Um, and that is why then you see this mass exodus of people because that's just, journalism can't exist um, in a free way. Mm. Yeah. John, do you want to take the Julian Assange question or should we leave that to Lucy? I don't. I, I don't really. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right, Lucy. Actually, I, I mean, I, 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 think, I, um, I think he's a kind of journalist. I think that he's, he's, he's a bad journalist. I think that he's, um, uh, I think that he's a, a flawed journalist. I think that, I think that he's uh, lost perhaps his way, but I'm certainly no expert. Um, but I, I, um, I, I think that there, there are some practices that are uh, in journalism that are sort of rightfully denigrated and ridiculed. Um, like what? Because, the, be, well, um, this, there's, there's sort of a, uh, there's sort of a tradition in American journalism. I'll just speaking to American journalism. There's sort of a tradition of, of, uh, even-handedness that that veers rapidly into the absurd, um, and 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 I and I think that I, and I think that there was perhaps a time where he was effectively sort of uh, challenging that 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 sort of absurdity that's inherent and in giving uh, equal weight to to all things. Um, but. Uh, like I said, I'm no expert on him, but th those are sort of my inexpert impression of him. Um, yes, yeah, so what I can say is that we, you know, we have been covering this, uh, Julian Assange's, Assange's situation since 2010. We do not support his extradition to the United States. Um, we see that as a massive blow to press freedom, um, and it will also have a chilling effect on, on many journalists as well. Um, I can send you the link to all of our reporting as well. Uh, yeah, I, I was I was actually very interested from the perspective of, of the law aspect of whether he should be treated as a journalist and whether a good or a bad journalist. But but you know, sort of, and, and so I was curious. You know, do you all put him in that box or do you put him in another box? I, I don't I don't have him in a box, and I and I agree I, I agree it entirely with uh, what Lucy said. I mean, I, I, bad and good journalist is, is sort of an afterthought, you know. Um, it, it, the, the profession itself um, deserves a, a sort of a certain different level of protection than sort of what, you, what I may personally think about those journalists. So apologies for not understanding your question entirely. No, thank, I, I, thank my apologies you. for not being clear. No, thanks, Alex. Nilafar, did you have a question? I sort of did, but it's mostly got answered. I was wondering, is there some kind of test for you know, whether under the First Amendment or just generally to determine whether someone is a member of the press? For example, does CPJ help, say, bloggers who are under threat, so who uh, counts as a journalist, and is there a formal way? Because there's no like licensing system for journalists, and to my knowledge, there's not a set legal definition. Yeah, no, great question. Um, our definition of a journalist is really broad. It is somebody who is basically doing an act of journalism. Um, so we would absolutely include bloggers in that. Um, during the 2020 protests, which have been referenced a lot during this talk because they were such um, a flashpoint in the history of press freedom in the United States, you know, we had people who were just live streaming on YouTube, um, but what they were doing, they were, that was a form of reporting. Um, and they would be classified if, if they were arrested for doing that, then that would that would be a press freedom violation um, for us. So there is there is no um, there is no test. A thornier issue, of course, gets into press credentials, and that came up a lot again during the protests as well. And that's something a little bit more difficult for people who are freelancers or who might be independent journalists. John, do you have a comment or? Should I go to the next one? Um, not, not really. I think it, I think it's notable uh, again, it, you know, to, to just to remind everyone that you know that um, you can become a journalist by performing a journalistic act, as Lucy said, you know, and and I think that 
you know, I, I, I think that that's actually a important civic information for people to absorb. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of my yeah. reaction to that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, Muhammad had a comment and then I'm going to go to Vijay, but Muhammad made the comment that many journalists are in jail in India and there are many problems in India currently. So, you know, who wants to comment on that? I'm happy to comment on that. Oh, it uh, looks like Muhammad oh, has he's been my stats. Yes. Um, Muhammad, you are right. There are many journalists in jail in India. Um, there are many issues with press freedom in India, notably in addition to arrests and killings that you mentioned there, the online harassment of female journalists is absolutely um, an enormous issue, it is extremely dangerous. It's, uh, there have been situations where that online harassment has tipped into, into real life harm. Um, and this is always something that we are trying to work out and understand, but it's a real problem. Yeah. You know, John, something just occurred to me when, you know, in relation to Nilafar's question about who's a journalist, do photojournalists ever get questioned, you know, or said or told, well, you're not a journalist because you're just taking pictures. Do you ever come across something like that? Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, you, you, uh, I, all journalists get challenged, you know, at least all of the journalists that I know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I know many, <laughs> they get challenged, you know. Um, and, you know, uh, fake news is just one of the, the sort of stances that people take, but it's not the only stance. And um, uh, sort of right wing criticisms of uh, journalists and fake news are not the only uh, place that these uh, criticisms and the concomitant dangers that sometimes emerge from that uh, come from, you know. Um, and uh, photojournalists, um, there's so many misconceptions about um, you know, can, let, let me give a quick anecdote uh, just to illustrate. So we've been paying close attention to um, uh, right-wing militant groups and we, we're, we're not necessarily, there, there's a real fine line where you can sort of inadvertently amplify something uh, by writing about it. And, and it's, it, it's, so we're super mindful about how we approach this. But at the same time, as we say in the trade, we've been gathering a lot of string. And so sometimes there'll be, you know, there'll, there'll be uh, some event where they're going to, we know they're going to show up and I'll send out a photographer, you know, with all due cautions. Uh, I, I think that everybody on this call probably knows, but you can walk around with outrageous weaponry openly exposed without any license in whatsoever in Texas, you know, um, and so there's a lot of situations where everybody is packing, you know, not just the police, you know, um, and not just the right wing people, you know, there have been in many situations where like so many people had guns, you know, and so, and so what comes with that sort of is this sort of the, the, if you have a gun, it's, it's so easy to get sort of to this bully place with it, you know, it's just, I have a gun, therefore I'm a bully. It's just sort of this switch, I think, in people's heads, you know. So uh, in this pr particular instance that I'm thinking of, I sent, uh, I sent one of our freelancers to uh, uh, a counter demonstration that was being held by a right-wing militant group up in North Texas. And they were uh, super hostile. And we were in constant com communication and I'd center with like really long glass, you know, like a really long lens um, and, and, you know, do not engage with these people and, you know, get away from them and don't, you know, uh, but she was taking the picture. So this is what happens. A couple of days later, I get an, I get a email from a woman who wants to buy all of the pictures that our photographer took. <laughs> and, uh, and the reason that she wants to buy them is because um, her husband if we were to publish these photographs, mm. he would probably lose his job, you know, mm. um, almost certainly lose his job. So she's, um, uh, so the, this reaction of you're not a journalist, you're not, you know, photojournalists aren't real, people with cameras aren't real journalists, you're just taking pictures. You know, a lot of that is coming from a, a defensive place. And candidly, I think that they actually know better. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Can we give VJ one more minute? It's 7.30, but he's been waiting. <laughs> Go ahead, VJ. Thank you, thank you. I loved both your presentations. 
uh, I don't have any journalistic background, but I'm a, a watcher of politics. Clearly, uh, that's reported by journalists on TV and uh, reading and everything. So a little personal question for either, uh, for both of you. Would you consider working for the extreme right-wing media or Fox News? And I don't put them both in the same category. Kind of it's like uh, Fox News is one level and the extreme right-wing media is uh, quite far out there. I gotcha. So, so what do you guys think? Fox News in your future? I'm, I, I'm happy to answer that. It's That's a, a really easy answer because I'm older and um, as uh, as I say about myself, I bleed Tribune yellow. <laughs> so, so I'm not going anywhere and I'm certainly not going to Fox and I'm certainly not going to ONA or, or whatever, you know, and but I'm also certainly not going to uh, the CBS Evening News or Time Magazine either. So that's a pretty easy one for me to handle. Yeah. But I, I understand what you're asking, you know, and mm -hmm. if I were younger and uh, uh, and open to job offers, I think that I, I, I think that I would consider any job where I felt like I might be able to make a difference and have an impact. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that would be the prison that I would study it under. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? Is that not evasive? <laughs> Yeah, no, no. I mean, well, look, I mean, um, I, I had a lot of respect for Chris Wallace. He was one of the people that I really look forward to listening to. And slowly and surely, these people are being ushered out of there. Right. Yeah. And, and, and so that that's my concern. So it's like right. the uh, the extreme right wing is sort of controlling the uh, narrative and the agenda. Mm -hmm. And I'm very uncomfortable with that because I mean, I, I, I mean, there are a lot of people that I'm a political news junkie and I'm a business news junkie because uh, I'm a financial advisor. So I have to, and the whole thing is kind of tied in together. Um, and so I'm listening to stuff, listening to, and then, um, uh, so uh, I have kind of noticed that shift to the extreme right and right. very unreasonable. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you okay. talked about Fox News at the last webinar also. So, Lucy, close us up <laughs> with your future with Fox News, if there is one. <laughs> um, there isn't one for now because I love my job very much. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, the way the way that we see this is if if we, we look at this uh, every case on a case by case basis. Right. So if there is a journalist for Fox News who has been arrested at a protest or a journalist for a different kind of outlet that has been arrested at a protest or has experienced another press freedom violation, we would look at that on a case by case basis. We have um, with the US press freedom tracker, we have documented cases of journalists for media outlets that would be considered considered, you know, right wing or extreme right wing, we have reported on them. Mm -hmm. So if you're on the extreme, we do look at that as a case by case basis. Thank you. Thank you both so much. I appreciate it. And I appreciate everyone who attended tonight. So it's been really, for me, especially eye opening. So it was great to hear both of your perspectives. So thank you. Um, Paul Washa or Nila Farr, do we have any closing comments from M Gage? I just want to echo that. Thank you both so much. This is uh, one of the first events of this kind we've done and we really appreciate you being here and offering insight into something that people who are not part of the media you don't get to see. I also wanted to thank you for your very nonpartisan answers to the, to the last <laughs> question. But uh, we um, also wanted to add that we as MKH, uh, if anyone is interested in uh, doing more with us, uh, Bolisha is putting together a training for those who want to either work in or volunteer in election protection. It's not quite as exciting as journalism protection maybe, but we are doing a training on October 1st. It'll be in person. And uh, if uh, we'll be sending up a link to that if anyone's interested, wanted to flag, we have that Saturday training coming up. Thank, Thank you, you all Thank so you. much. Yeah, And I volunteered as an election protector and it's a little, it can be a little exciting. <laughs> Only when you see something egregious happening. Paul Asha, do you have any final comments or? Okay, I guess not. No, I'm just thank you guys so much for coming. Okay. I learned a lot. It was really like I also tabbed all of the um, links that you shared because I think <laughs> we I should send them out too. to the guys. 
Yeah, for sure. And since we were recording, the chat will be saved. So again, thanks to everyone for coming. And thank you, Lucy and John, for sharing your expertise and your perspective. You know, I've learned a lot. I think everyone else has as well. So thank, thank you very you. much. Good night, everybody. Thank you very much. Can I make Goodbye. a quick announcement? Yes, please. Um, so um, one thing that's relevant to this is there, there's a movie called Boycott. Mm -hmm. And in it is a journalist from Arkansas, the uh, editor of Arkansas Times, who was taken to uh, task the anti-BDS laws because he, uh, he doesn't want editorial content being controlled by the state. And that's going to be available for free to watch for four days if you go to voicesfromtheholyland.org. And then there'll be a panel discussion on October 9th. All right. So you know, it's interesting about... Yeah. laws that are related to uh, that, that affect journalism. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Good night, everybody. Bye. Good night, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. I don't know if the engaged people are staying on, so I'm going to stay on. I'll, I'll, I'll get off now. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Lucy. Yeah. So I don't know, do we? Hi, Sally. Sally is in Brazil, I believe, and she's still joined us. So thank Aww. you so much for being here. Oh, nice, thank you. So, um, I'm uh, locked out of the office, so I'm about to lose my bat uh, battery on my laptop. Oh, okay. let me rejoin. If we're having a meeting, I'll rejoin by phone. Okay. okay. Um, are we? Are the engage people? going to chat before we close out or are we done we're done we're good good excellent that was okay. awesome though like the everything i learned about the field it was excellent i don't think a lot of people know about mm -hmm. this stuff about that life so yeah. i'm glad we know and we're going to relay that there you go and especially what's going on in other countries yes so all right well good night everybody Good night. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye.